Morning, Tribe. I am so thankful that you have joined us today. We have Dr. Jessica Chung, who started her nursing career in 2009 with her associates and has just soared and pursued her doctoral degree in 2018 and now has her own practice. I'm so glad you've joined us, Jessica. Thank you for having me, Chelsea. Yes. So just introduce yourself. Tell us the important highlights of who you are and what brought you to where you're at today. Well, everyone, thank you um, for joining in. I'm Dr. Jessica Chung, and as Chelsea Benson mentioned, I started my nursing career way back in 2010 with my associate's degree. Um, originally born and raised in New York, came down to Florida in 2011 in search of a hospital job because in New York it was kind of hard to find a position um, as a new grad nurse in a hospital. So I came down, I continued on and got my bachelor's. And then 2013, I went back for my master's, got my um, master's as a family nurse practitioner. And then lo and behold, I thought I was done. Um, I really didn't have plans to go right back to school for my doctorate. But um, I decided to so then went back in 2017, and then got my doctorate in 2018. And um, so I've been practicing. I've been a nurse, an RN for a total of 10 years. I was practicing as an RN for five years, and now I've been a nurse practitioner practicing for the past five years. Awesome. That is quite a journey. And I know lots of people put in so many questions. So we're going to get through these as best we can. Um, and those of you who are watching, feel free to add questions and we'll get to them. So when did you realize you had a passion for nursing as a career? So I grew up with my, um, my grandmother was a nurse and she's originally, she was originally from the island of Jamaica. So um, she came to the States um, as a young woman. She was working as a home health aide. Then she went on um, and advanced her career. What was so amazing about my grandmother is that she went back to school in her 40s. She went back to get her bachelor's degree in nursing. Nice. Um, so she definitely was someone who I spent a lot of time with. Um, well, any like summers or vacation, I would go with her to see her patients. She was a home care nurse. And I used to think this is so boring. But it really um, impacted me because I would see all the work she did. And so I tried to veer away from nursing for a long time. And then finally, I decided, you know what, it was something I should be doing. And so finally, I decided to go into nursing school. And I went into nursing school with the goal of being a nurse practitioner. Okay. I knew I had not heard of that position or that career prior. But once I found out about it, I knew that that was the reason for me going into nursing school. That's really interesting. So what made you choose family nurse practitioning versus any other avenue of masters? Um, I, I definitely wanted to be in a position where I wanted to take care of patients and be an advocate for patients. Um, so as an RN, as I gained more experience, I started seeing things in the, especially in the hospital systems where I was like, you know, something more could have been done or patients are not getting the proper follow up in the outpatient setting that they should. So I knew that I wanted to do something on the provider level um, as opposed to, let's say, education or administration. I knew I wanted to be in the role of a provider. Good. So how long did you say you worked as a nurse prior to going back to school? And do you feel like there's a certain rule of thumb that people should kind of go by? So, um, so technically, I went back to for my master's in 2013. So I actually had been an RN only three years okay. um, before I went, decided to go back to school. Mm -hmm. I definitely don't think there's any rule of thumb um, because obviously you have to have that RN experience. So whether you're in school getting the experience and you go right from your BSN to your MSN or ADN to MSN, I think as long as you have some ground um, basic principles of nursing and um, patient care, and that qualifies you to go on and advance your career and your education. Okay. So how would you describe your family nurse practitioning program? Were you able to work? What was that, you know, big picture? What was that like? 
So I was in my um, nurse practitioner program for two and a half years, just about. Um, so I started probably, I think, for like the first year. I was still working like three twelves, three twelve hour shifts. Um, you know, in the hospitals. And I probably even worked more because, you know, I was always trying to save my money. Um, I would say in that second year of that program, things definitely slowed down for me as far as working, um, especially when I started clinicals. When I started clinicals, I realized I was like, OK, this is rough. Um, so, I mean, it would probably vary from me doing three twelves to two twelves. Um, but I will say that last semester of my nurse practitioner program, I was down to working one day a week. I think I just made enough money to buy groceries and pay some bills. And that was it. My focus was finishing that program. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So when you were working in the hospital, going through school, what type of nursing did you do to kind of bridge or, or prepare you for family nurse practitioning? What was your role like? So I always worked med, med surge. That was my main um, unit that I've always worked on as an RN. But I always flowed into other um, departments. So I worked everywhere from the ER. Um, I did a lot of ICU as well, PCU. Um, I also worked in labor and delivery, perioperative. So I worked pretty much in most of the, you know, the major departments in the hospital. And I think what has helped me with that is that being able to see the different areas of nursing definitely has taught me some principles and some giving me knowledge as far as outpatient care in a family practice setting. Yeah, yeah, that's great that you got kind of a broad spectrum overview. Yeah. So Philippe is asked, um, my ultimate goal is CRNA. However, during my time as an FMP, I want to work emergency medicine. I chose FNP over ACNP clinicals. However, it cannot be acute. Should I be doing post-master ANCNP or continue on to CRNA for a more critical care experience? I've done nothing but critical care and emergency medicine, and I want to continue with that. Any suggestions on next steps? All right. So she wants to, ultimate goal is CRNA. Yeah. Um, so from what I know with the few uh, CRNAs I know is that they had a background in critical care. Right. So you definitely want to get that critical care experience. And um, I believe I'm, some programs even ask you to have that critical care experience. So I think that you're on the route, right track going, um, staying in critical care if your ultimate goal is CRNA. Yeah, and then uh, F and P route due to the pediatric portion since AGA CNP doesn't provide pediatrics. So my when when my mentees and um comes and ask me should they what route should they take, I always tell everyone you have to do what you want. But if you are wanting to see a wide range of um, patients and um kind of the job market is more open for FNP, then I say go the FNP route. Now, for example, pediatrics is not my favorite. I do see children, but um, it's, it's you know, the kids, it's, it's a, it could be, you know, challenging sometimes. But nonetheless, I'm glad I have the experience as an FNP because I can see children. Um, I know FNPs that do work in acute care settings. I have worked in acute care setting. So just depending on the employer in your state, you definitely can work in different settings as an FNP if you have the, the right training. So you have to take different boards based on what your focus is going to be. Yes, you definitely will take different boards. Um, so, for example, I would say if you... If you definitely want to stay adult, then, you know, go the adult geriatric um, route as far as your your um, education and your boards go. But if you do definitely want to provide care for pediatrics um, and, you know, that population, then go the FNP route. OK, good, good, good. So how did you choose which school to go to? Wow. So I really, you know, that's probably going back to 2013. Mm -hmm. I just probably did like a Google search. I, so I was very clear on the fact that I wanted to do a program that was flexible. 
Um, I, I, because I worked crazy hours and my schedule changed at the drop of a dime, I didn't want to be tied down to a program that's per se, let's say, um, they said, come once a week, you have to sit in the class six hours, because I never knew what my schedule was going to be like. So I was very, um, particular about choosing a program that was flexible and that I could work around my own schedule. Okay. So did you do most of it online? It was most of it online. And I tell people just because things are online did not make it any easier. Um, exams were just as hard, mm -hmm. you know, doing clinicals, you have to, you know, schedule yourself appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it wasn't any different from being in a classroom live setting. Sure. So when you're choosing an online program with clinicals, how do you ensure that they're going to match you with an appropriate clinical assignment or did you take those factors so the that, well so just going back a couple of years it was definitely not hard finding preceptors and i know like now it definitely has become challenging um so the school i went to which was south university they had us find our own clinical sites, okay. which I loved it because I was very close to home. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to drive very far from my preceptors and clinicals. Um, so that was probably my main factor is that I didn't want to be far from home, far from work, driving an hour or two, or even what I hear today, people are relocating for clinicals. And so I think that there was an advantage to finding your own clinical sites yeah. as opposed to for some individuals, you may not want the stress of finding your own clinical site. So maybe choosing a school in which they to find clinical sites for you would be a better option. Okay. And um, another question, how do you suggest we go about finding preceptors when we're not familiar with certain areas that are required? Right. So I was pretty bold when it came to finding preceptors. I would like go to doctor's offices and I would just say, hey, I'm a student. I need a preceptor. Um, so probably about, I would say, a good number of my preceptors. I literally just went into their offices and said, handed my resume and said, I need a preceptor. Um, one of my preceptors, he was a physician in the hospital and I was on the floor that day. And I was like, hey, can you precept me? And he was like, sure, call my office. And that was it. Um, so I was very bold and that's what you kind of have to do because it's it's hard to find preceptors. And what I just want to preface and say for those of you who are having difficulty finding preceptors, nurse practitioners are swamped. Um, physicians are even swamped. So it's hard and um, to accommodate students and teach them. But you, there's still preceptors out there that are willing to help. So don't give up on your search. But you definitely have to be ready and prepared. Have your resume ready. Um, network. Go to, you know, your council, your nurse practitioner council um, meetings. Network with other nurse practitioners. Um, go to, you know, CEU conferences. Network with physicians and other PAs and nurse practitioners. And you are, you definitely will find someone who's willing to take you on. That's great advice. Did you ever use LinkedIn or any of those uh, platforms to get your name out there? Um, for clinicals, no. It was really like I would literally call. You just hustle. Show up at the office. Yeah. <laughs> now I know with the pandemic that probably may not be the best route. That's but true. You definitely, I would say, definitely use LinkedIn to your advantage. Um, use emailing to your advantage. And but my thing uh, when I when students come to me. Um, I like to have see their resume and their experience. So have present your resume, send your resume, email your resume so that they see the experience you have. Okay, good points. So how did you weigh the cost of the program versus the increased wage you would be receiving post-grad? It sounds like your mind was pretty made up that you were going to be F&P. Did you do it? Yeah. Weighing it? Oh, to be honest with <laughs> I did not. So, no. yes, I did look at cost as a factor. Sure. Um, that was important. That was more so important when I was doing my doctorate because I was a little older. <laughs> but when I was doing my master's, it was more so about the program and not so much the cost. Um, yes, cost was a factor, but I'm one of those people, if I'm going to do something, I need, I need to get it done. 
and cost wasn't something that I was too worried about. Um, student loans wasn't something I was too worried about. Um, even though, yes, you know, I do have student loans, but it's not something that, you know, it doesn't, it hasn't ruined my life. <laughs> so, but I would definitely say my doctorate program, I definitely was more um, conscious of cost. Okay. Um, some doctorate programs were much more than others. And so I think um, I attended Samford University and they were, um, the cost was much less than other programs that I looked into. Okay, that's good. So when taking the FNP boards, is it similar to our RN boards in that we can move state to state, but yet just pay the Board of Nursing to give us a license in their state? How does that work? Yeah, so um, for the two main um, certifying bodies is AANP and ANCC. Yeah. And you, whatever, which one you decide to take um, for whatever track you're going. So um, for example, like, oncology nurse practitioners, they have a separate um, board. But let's say if you're going FNP, adult, geriatric, pediatric, um, you can take the boards wherever. And then if you decide to, if you live in Florida, you decide to practice in California, you just have to apply to that state for your license. Okay. And there's some limitations in practice from state to state as well, right? Uh, yes. Um, okay. Every state is not equal as far as... Um, practice. Yep. So for example, I'm in Florida and we are getting, well, primary care nurse practitioners are getting full practice authority on July 1st. Hey. Um, so that has been a fight for years now. Yeah. But let's say um, like states like Arizona or Nevada, those nurse <laughs> practitioners have been ha have had full practice authority for a long, a long time. Uh -huh. um, and then there's some states where they're not fully full practice authority, but they're not restrictive. So their nurse practitioners have a little more uh, wiggle room as far as practicing independently. So every state is different as far as practicing um, independently or practicing with a collaborative physician. Okay, so Felipe wants to know if you're not owning your own practice and you are working as a nurse practitioner in a, someone else's practice, which it sounds like you did that, right? Yes. Did you feel like you were treated as one of the providers or was there a difference in the way that you were treated as a team member? So um, in, in some cases, I definitely felt like I was treated as one of the providers. Okay. Um, but we, what you do have to kind of keep in mind when you're working in someone else's practice, um, you are not the owner of that business. And so the ultimate decisions are sometimes they're not made by you at all sure. and you do have to go with the flow mm -hmm. um there is sometimes um if you are going into a practice that's been established and the staff has been there for years um just bear in mind you kind of have to gain the the respect of the staff at the same time you kind of have to demand the respect as a provider mm -hmm. um so that's something definitely i've experienced going into um, you know, a practice and kind of, you know, demanding my respect as a provider with the support staff. And, um, but once you, you know, lay out your, your, your rules, you know, they just have to go with it, but you never should feel like you're being overlooked. You never should feel like, um, support staff is not respecting you. In that case, you should definitely speak with management about that. Okay. And then any benefits on clinical practice to having your DNP over your MSN FNP? Should we immediately go after our doctoral license? Um, so I definitely um, am an advocate for the DNP. My DNP program was nothing like um, my MSN. Um, it taught me a lot. I think it opened me up more to focusing on evidence-based practice. Okay. Um, so not just why do I prescribe this medication, but focusing on the evidence of why we do this in our treatment plans. Um, it also opened me up to healthcare business, believe it or not. So my DNP program really expanded in um, my my knowledge on what it takes to really, you know, be in the healthcare business, not just as a provider, you know, practicing, but what does it take to be a leader in um, the healthcare world? And what is it that we need to change? What are some things that need to be done? 
um, as far as um, improving patient outcomes. So for me, the doctoral program was absolutely what I needed. I'm glad I did it. Um, I'm glad I didn't wait. Um, if you obviously everybody's situation is different. Um, I'm still single. I don't have any children yet. So I had all the opportunities to just go forward as opposed to someone who, you know, you may have children, you may be married. So you, there's some things you need to take into consideration. But if you know you want to go the doctoral route, by all means, just go for it. Um, you know, look for schools um, that fit your criteria and just go just go after it. Yeah. So um, when you first stepped on as a family nurse practitioner, what is that training as a nurse practitioner like? I mean, we know what the training as an RN, we're kind of slowly led into these more critical cases. What is it like for a nurse practitioner? Um, so when I did my clinicals, um, I definitely had some tough preceptors. Yeah. Um, so I definitely had to come right and come correct when it came to um, making sure I was, you know, down to like just forming an HPI. Um, I had a preceptor. I, I love her even to this day. She did not let me do anything with the patient until I knew how to write a proper HPI. And okay. so I love that because now... When I look at my students, I'm like, oh, no, you got to come on. We got to fix this HBI. I So I'm good with writing HBIs. I love um, the fact that I went through different, all different types of preceptors, you know, from they came from all walks of life. They came, they had different backgrounds because I learned so much from each of them. Yeah. So my training definitely um, was intense. Mm -hmm. Um I definitely would see a full, you know, full patient load um, in some of my clinicals. I was very hands on in my clinicals. Okay. I mean, you know, as a student, I was in the operating room, um, you know, with my uh, women's health preceptor. She took me into the operating with, room with her to do DNCs, C-sections. I definitely had probably an above average experience. <laughs> as um, a, for family nurse practitioner clinicals. But, you know, I, like I said, it's because I chose my preceptors. Mm -hmm. So that's what I loved about that is I knew what I was getting. Yeah, that's that's a great point in choosing your yeah. own. Field. So we've been chatting for a while. And we haven't even gotten to the big picture is that you started <laughs> your own practice. So let's get there. OK, <laughs> so, um, what made you choose to open your own practice? So I knew, I knew I was, I wanted to open my own practice. All right. I definitely, um, so back then when it was just an idea, I had no idea what to do. I, and I honestly, I couldn't even find someone to mentor me, to help me. So I just started doing the research and I was like, okay, how does, you know, nurse practitioner open their practice? Um, and even then you couldn't find even a lot of information on the internet about it because, um, nurse practitioners were doing it, but they weren't, um, I guess there wasn't a lot of information being shared about it. Yeah. So I was doing a lot of research. Um, I went through my doctoral program and, you know, once I graduated, I started a business, but it wasn't a practice. I started my speaking and mentoring business, which I still do. So I was doing like public speaking engagements and things like that. And so people would come to me and was like, you know, where's your office? I want to be your patient. And I'm like, I don't have an office yet. Um, so then I was like, you know what? I really need to hone in on this. Yeah. So finally, after, you know, studying um, my board of nursing statutes, because the most important thing is that you want to make sure you're in compliance. Um, mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you can, it, it's something that can be done. And so to just clear up some misconceptions, um, a lot of people ask, well, how does a nurse practitioner own a practice? Anybody can own a business. Anybody mm -hmm. could start a business. So simply, I'm just, I was just a nurse practitioner that was starting a business. So I decided to start the practice. I found a collaborative physician um, and in the state of Florida, the collaborative physician does not have to be on site. Okay. They do not have to do any chart reviews. Um, they don't have to sign off on anything. So basically all I needed him to do was be available by phone. Okay. Once I had that in place, got all the licensing and the certifications for the state, um, you know, to make sure that, you know, I had everything in place to operate as a medical office. 
Um, I opened my doors and I started out as a house calls. So I was going to patients' homes and seeing them. And then I transitioned and I got office space. And um, it's been um, a great journey. There's been, a, it's a lot of work. It's definitely a lot of work, but I definitely wouldn't change it. Um, I did work um, while I was doing my practice. So I would see patients after work. I would see patients on the weekends. Um, you know, I was seeing patients at all odd hours. Um, people were coming to me in church after church, like, hey, can you help me? I'm not feeling well. And I would like, you know, see them in the bathroom. <laughs> but nonetheless, it was, it was, it's all a humbling experience because I was finally in a place where people were coming to me and said, hey, can I be your patient? And I could finally say yes, as yeah. opposed to, um, no, I don't have an office yet, or no, I'm not, I'm not set up to practice yet. Yeah. So um, it definitely, it has been experienced and it still is. So I love that you did house calls and then transitioned to a brick and mortar. That's a genius. I love that idea. Yes. <laughs> so definitely um, is a great way to save money as you're building your business. Um, it definitely, I mean, there's challenges, you know, driving all over the place, seeing patients. Um, but definitely if I, I suggest if anybody's wanting to start a practice, you definitely want to start with a model that's low overhead. And what made you decide to stop doing house visits and do strictly brick and mortar? Is there a, a reason? Yeah. So um, some more, more opportunities came about that required me to have an office space. Okay. Um, so one thing I teach my clients about is subcontracting, independent contracting, um, which is a form of self-employment. And okay. so one of the contracts I have that requires me to have office space. And so I really looked at, you know, the calculations of, you know, having this contract and paying for office space. And it definitely outweighed, the benefits outweighed it, everything, you know, I was still able to bring in a profit with the contract. So basically pay for office space, pay for supplies and still be profitable. That's great. So what were the most critical things from a business standpoint. You talked about licensure and contracts and um, weighing your profit. Anything else from a business standpoint in terms of, I don't know, what else is there to think about from a business standpoint? Um, from a business standpoint, you definitely want to be mindful of financial cost. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, unless you have the capital, unless you have the income, I don't suggest you just go out there and say, I'm going to lease this office for $2,000 a month and you're paying for something, you have no patients, you have no clients coming in. So you definitely wanna be smart about um, calculating your financial cost. Um, so one thing I do with my clients is um, I do business plans. You gotta have a business plan. You gotta have something written out that shows what you're planning to do. You also wanna look at your market. Um, so like if you're going to start a house calls practice, well, in your area, how many house calls practices are there? Is your area saturated with house calls practice or is there no one doing house calls practices? You definitely want to look at the market of the type of practice you're wanting to start to see if this is something where you have low competition or if you're going to have a lot of competition. Um, so you definitely want to look at your market. You definitely want to look at the type of clients or the patients that you want. Mm -hmm. um, are you in an area where you can get the type of patients for concierge practice? Or are you in an area that the patients mostly have Medicaid? So you want to think about those things when you're starting your practice. Um, and there's a lot that goes into, you know, figuring out what to do and how to do it. And so, you know, that's something that I advise. So you specifically, okay, for two things. First, you're talking about clients and advising. It sounds like you actually help nurse practitioners start yes, that. Yes, I do. That's so cool. <laughs> I didn't know that. Okay. All right. So, that's amazing. I didn't know that that was part of your, your services. That's super cool. So I apologize that I didn't know that. That's amazing. That's okay. Well, now people can reach out to you and say, Jessica, I need your help. Okay. Yes. Yes, please do. That's great. That's great. Okay. So you mentioned Medicaid. Let's talk about that insurance piece of it. How do you make all that work? 
And what does that time look like for you? Yeah. So just depending on what your state you're in. So, um, you know, insurers are different for every state. Um, Florida is has been a little slower as far as credentialing, but it still can be done. Okay. Um, just and it really is state specific. Um, COVID has definitely, in my opinion, sped up the credentialing process for some companies for nurse practitioners, as opposed to it could definitely take up to six months for credentialing. So my advice for anyone that wants to start a practice, um, as far as if you want to accept insurance, you definitely want to start that process sooner. Now, there are ways to start a practice where you're just cash services only. Oh. So you could do a concierge practice in which obviously that's just cash based services. You could do direct primary care, which is something I do where your patients um, pay a monthly fee for your services, which doesn't involve any insurance. IV hydration businesses typically don't involve any health insurance. So there's definitely routes you can go with insurance based practices and cash based practices. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Um, yep. That's so cool. So Felipe asked, do you suggest opening a business with someone so they can focus on the business and legal aspect and you can focus on the medical part? How do you do that in terms of staffing and co-owning? Share your experience. So I, <laughs> I am a one woman show when it comes to my business. That's amazing. Um, I did not, I don't have any co-owners. Um, I definitely have an assistant and I'm actually in the process of hiring a medical assistant, but I did everything on my own. Okay. Um, I want two things I advise hiring or, or consulting um, an attorney and an accountant. Um, definitely you want to consult with an attorney and accountant. But as far as um, if you want a business partner, you definitely can. But when it comes to having business partners, just be mindful. Your business partner has to be someone you can trust. Yeah. Um, you just don't want to go out and find some random person and say, hey, let's start a business together. So I advise um, either it's a classmate, a colleague, a family member, someone who understands what you're trying to do as mm -hmm. far as starting a business. Um, but starting a business is not for the faint at heart. You do have to take on many roles and you de definitely have to do a lot. Um, so I make a joke. I'm the founder, owner, CEO, CFO, HR director. Um, I'm everything when it comes to my um, practice. But as you grow, then you can consider, you know, taking on staff, hiring a part-time assistant, hiring a part-time medical assistant. But that's the things that come as you grow. That definitely is not going to, it's not, definitely not going to look like that in the first few months. Sure. Yeah, that's all great advice. I'm learning so much. This is so cool. <laughs> so, any hardships or lessons that you feel like you could share, maybe mistakes that you made that we Oh, yes. Up? Anytime you're hiring someone to do something for you, research them. Just, you know, find out, are they, are they legitimate? Do they, do they have a legitimate business? Um, that's something I've learned from myself, especially before you pay someone any amount of money. I don't care if it's a dollar. Always have a contract in place when you are doing any type of business. Read the terms of your contract. Um, that's something that... Um, I can't stress enough when it comes to um, doing anything when it comes to starting a business, especially as healthcare professionals. It's not something we learn in school. You know, nursing school didn't teach us how to start a business or nursing school teaches us how to be a nurse. Um, same thing with um, MSN programs. Unless you're on like an administration route, you really probably don't know much about healthcare business. Um, so that's something I I mentioned a lot. I was like, you know what? Nursing school um, doesn't teach you anything about running or owning a business. So these are things that you have to kind of go outside of your comfort zone and, and find. Um, there's a lot of places where you can get free business classes um, okay. that will teach you different things about running and starting a business. So you definitely, when you're starting a business as a healthcare professional, you're definitely going outside of your comfort zone. Um, and which is something I had to do um, because as uh, especially in nursing, 
we are taught to be so loving and caring and kind. But as a business owner, I've had to put my foot down a lot, you know, especially when it comes to finances. Um, so that's just something that you have to learn along the way. Okay. Do you offer labs and x-ray in-house? Um, so I, not in-house. What I do, my patients go to the lab and they're able to get their labs drawn. I could definitely draw labs in my office, but um, it's more convenient that the patient can schedule a labs, especially if they have to be fasting. That way they just go to the off, um, go to the lab and get their labs done. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with x-rays and any diagnostic imaging. Um, patients are able to go to the radiology centers and get their tests done. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, these questions were all submitted prior, so they're kind of choppy and don't really flow, but we're going to go. Okay. Um, so from a financial aspect, do you feel like owning your own practice was a good move for you? For financially, for me, it was a good move. Um, so the great thing about starting a private practice is that you could do it part time and you can so you could still work full time and do the practice part time. Yeah. Um, and you could do part time PRN work and still do the practice. So I think the great thing about any type of business ownership is that it's you can make it flexible for you. Yeah. Um, for me, it was definitely I was in a season in my career, in my life where I knew it was time to move forward with starting my practice. And so now because other opportunities opened up for me be, from starting my practice, it definitely is profitable for me. Um, I probably don't know where I could find a job um, that will bring in the income that I bring in, even through the pandemic. Honestly, I was still bringing in income. Um, but like I said, this this is not something that happened overnight for me. So I just want people to realize it takes some time before your business can go autopilot. And yeah. even um, I still do marketing. I still, you know, am marketing to get new patients, to do new things in my practice that will bring in more business. So it said it's really a never ending job. You're, you're always going to be looking for ways to to bring in more revenue. So let's talk a little bit about marketing for patients. Where are you advertising? Where do you where do you do that? I do Facebook ads marketing. Um, oh. That that has really been um, great for me. Okay. Because my patient population is like mid twenties to mid forties, and that's the perfect age range for f Facebook. Um, as opposed to, let's say, if you are wanting to serve the geriatric population, um, your patients may not be on Facebook. Right. So you may have to do like maybe old school marketing, you know, posting or sending out brochures in the mail, um, which I know some colleagues that they do that for their practice. Um, you definitely also want to connect with specialty offices because they need to refer their patients to a primary care provider. So um, so there's all sorts of ways to do marketing. You mm -hmm. definitely don't have to be a marketing genius to learn marketing. Um, I definitely was not comfortable with uh, advertising. Um, I just had this misconception about sales and marketing but now being a business owner i realize how important it is for your business absolutely so felipe is asking was it difficult and expensive to acquire medical devices actually no um that probably was not hard for me at all so i definitely took advantage of finding um, refurbished items. Um, so that's definitely something you want to do. Um, you can even lease medical devices. You can lease exam tables. Believe it or not, you can lease an exam table. You can lease um, an EKG machine. Um, you can buy equipment very inexpensively. Um, some um, companies will even give you like samples of things. Like, for example, um, I a company sent me a bunch of speculums just the sample. Okay. Um, so like I have more speculums that I'm doing pap smears <laughs> just because they sent me. So there's ways that you can get equipment and medical devices um, inexpensively. And the, again, that's something um, I that's very important is you don't want to just go out and just buy a bunch of things and then you never use them. So I actually buy things as I have a need for them. Smart. 
Yeah. So that was actually leading into his next question. What were your steps to acquiring contracts for your medical supplies or finding the best vendors for your business? So I am probably like the Google queen. I am going to search for a deal until I find the best deal. Okay. So if someone gives me a price, I'm going to see if someone can beat your offer. Um, so as far as getting contracts with um, companies, you just have to reach out to the companies. Um, a lot of companies are, they're, they will treat nurse practitioners no different than if they treat a physician or a large um, healthcare system. Okay. You are still a consumer and believe it or not, they want your money. So you just reach out to them. They have a sales rep that will reach out to you, set up a contract. That way, you know, you set up a contract to get patients um, to get their labs done, a contract for patients to get imaging done, a contract to get your supplies. Um, so you just look for the vendors that are in your area and um, even like um, samples um, from Superettes. They'll visit my office and um, they'll, you know, they bring me lunch and they, you know, tell me about their product. And so it's, it's definitely the same way you would see it done in any other medical office. That's awesome. So, uh, do you have to pay for your, uh, your inspections and such for your office setting? What does that look like? So for example, let's say, um, biohazard waste, um, yeah. the county for me, I have to, I had to submit an application to the county. Okay. And so um, what they'll do is they'll uh, approve your application, they'll send you your permit, and then they'll tell you someone will come out to just make sure like simple things like you have your sharps container okay. um, and you have your um, manual um, in place to make sure that you know how to, to dispose of biomedical waste. Um, let's say if you wanted to set up a lab in your office, um, they will send someone out just to make sure everything looks right and inspect it. Um, as far as like other inspections, um, just to, like, again, just depends on what state you're in. Every state is different as far as if they need to inspect or if they don't need to inspect. Okay. So what advice would you give? Maybe just a few points of those who are wanting to start their own practice. What advice do you have for them? The advice I would have is if you if you absolutely want to start your practice, you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of times we, as human beings, we like to procrastinate or we let fear and doubt get in the way. And we probably think, oh, I can't do this. I, I don't think it will be successful. I don't think that I'll get any patience. But you can't have those thoughts until you at least try it. So I would rather know I tried it than to say I never tried it and I don't know if I was successful. So I would advise that you definitely just have to start. Um, you definitely have to be prepared for um, surprises, I would say, um, costs that you didn't probably um, expect before. Um, and you definitely want to be smart and strategic about how you go about starting your practice because... Um, you definitely don't want to go, obviously, you don't want to go bankrupt. You don't want to spend all your money. And oh, just to put another uh, thing out there, I didn't take out any business loans. Um, I didn't use any business credit cards when I started my practice. So this definitely can be done with the income you are earning from an employer. Um, it, it definitely is possible. Um, so if you know there's a need, for more providers wherever you live your area or you may have a business idea that you don't see you don't see anyone else doing it maybe there's a need that you're that people are waiting for you patients are waiting for you to start this particular practice so my thing is that have faith and just do it <laughs> oh you're inspiring i love it <laughs> all right so what's the most difficult part i mean we're talking about the good stuff and you're you, i mean you've definitely shared some some yeah. struggles along the way, but what would you say is the most difficult part that we need to be aware of? I think the most difficult part is the many hats I have to wear. Yeah. Um, you know, I, like I said, I am, I'm everything right now. I, I well, I, I take, I mean, there's some things I have delegated, but in the beginning I was doing it all by myself. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of us, we, even as RNs, we work with CNAs or patient care techs. And they're able to, we're able to delegate things with them to them. Or if you're working as a nurse practitioner, you're able to delegate 
things to your medical assistant or an RN that you might work with. When you're in your own practice, you you are it. You are doing everything. You are doing the follow-ups. You're taking the vital signs. You're charting. Um, you're doing the referrals. You're doing everything. So it that definitely can be a challenge sure. because you're wearing you're wearing a lot of hats and you're taking on a lot of roles. But if it's worth it to you, then it's rewarding. That's great advice. <laughs> So um, Philip wants to know how he can contact you. So why don't you tell everybody <laughs> about your side hustle, essentially, but maybe it was your first hustle. I don't know, girl, you've got a lot going on. <laughs> um, so just tell us how we can contact you and what resources you provide and what kind yeah. of services we can reach out to you for. So, OK, so as far as contacting me, um, I am on Facebook. You can find me via my personal page or my business page, which personal is Jessica Chung. Um, my business is, page is Dr. Jessica Chung, and you can contact me by email, um, my phone number, my website, www.drjessicachung.com. All of my contact information is there. And I also just started a new project, which is the International Biz Business Association for Nurses, which is basically going to be focused on helping nursing professionals start and grow their businesses. So I'm doing a launch in a couple of weeks, which will be a live Facebook launch. And I'm just going to have other nurses that are entrepreneurs come on and share their story. Cause I don't want people just hear my perspective. I want people to hear other pers um, perspectives. So you can find um, also on Facebook, international business association for nurses. Um, if you want to join in on that endeavor as well. Awesome. As far as if you want to reach out to me for one-on-one, -on -one, I do one-on-one -on -one consulting and I do group consulting as well. And I actually have my next nurse practitioner workshop coming up, which is a half day virtual workshop. It's on July 25th. All of that you can find on my page as well. You can register um, tickets, um, early bird tickets are available right now. And so that is also a way to help you jumpstart into starting your own practice. Um, so I'm going to give, I give a lot of tools. I give a lot of um, advice. I show you how to do things all on your own as far as starting your own practice. So um, I have a lot that I do, but um, I'm always available if anyone has questions, if you reach out to me. That is so great. Thank you so much for all this really applicable, useful productive information. Um, would you say that that conference is more geared towards nurses who are already nurse practitioners versus those who are looking forward to that? So I've actually had nurse practitioner students okay. um, in that workshop. Um, okay. They've taken my workshop. So I don't, I don't discriminate. If you know that you want to start a practice, by all means, get the knowledge and get it early. One thing I wish I would have done is I wish that as soon as I had like got into um, nurse practitioner school that I would have started um, looking into starting my practice. Yeah. So if you are a nurse practitioner student, by all means, you can definitely um, join in. Now for my nurses who maybe, maybe you don't want to start a practice, maybe you want to start some other type of business. Um, the International <laughs> Business Association for Nurses yes. will be focused on um, nursing, helping nursing professionals start whatever business is that you want to start. So what maybe you want to open up a assisted living facility. Maybe you want to start a CNA school. Maybe you want to start a scrub line. Whatever you wanted to do, that organization is focused on that. I love that. That's amazing. All right. So just tell us last thing, what you're most looking forward to in your career. I think I'm just looking forward to growing um, and, and advancing um, I always have like so many ideas and things I want to do. So, and, and I think where I am right now is that I am also focused on helping other nursing professionals grow because I've seen, especially during a pandemic, it's sad to see, you know, nurse practitioners getting laid off and furloughed. And I'm just thinking, wow, you know, if you if you are in a position where you can switch gears and focus on building your brand or building your business, um, then you won't be it won't be such a uh, a space where you're wondering what you're going to do next. Yeah. So it's not and what I want to kind of tell people it's not if this happens again, it's just when. 
yeah. um, that that something like this could happen again. And you want to be in a place where you are financially secure, yet you are not dependent on a job and that you can switch gears and focus on, you know, generating income through your side business, side businesses. Yeah, absolutely. I love that advice and I love your vision. All right. Yes. We're going to close. We thank you so much for joining us today to everyone who tuned in. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. See you later. Thank you everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye.